Well, thank you for this opportunity to pay a tribute to Dave Stencil. It really is an honor for me to talk about such a great man. Next slide, please. What I'd like to do is to tell you about my history with Dave Stencil, how I got to know him, how we worked together, and leading up to the last time I communicated with him uh, and his passion on uh, the subject that we are talking about. Uh, we recently had a tribute to Dave Stencil, of which I've taken one slide here. And in this tribute, we made uh, note of his tremendous achievement over all these years. And uh, he got his PhD from Cornell University in 1971. And uh, next slide, please. I also met him in 1972 for the first time, and that was early into his career, uh, at a pilot plant. He was working for Anchor at the time, and Anchor decided to take up the pilot program from the uh, Institute in South Africa. And I traveled to Salt Lake City. They picked me up at the airport, took me to his house, which set the pattern for the next 40 years. Later, we traveled through the USA to promote the concept, and finally, we designed the first plant in Palmetto, Florida. And later, we had many opportunities to work together, including compiling the first book on BNNR uh, with uh, Dr. Cliff Randall as, as editor, 10 years on the New York City Advisory Committee courses, and so forth. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, year, the same year that I met Dave Stencil, I discovered biological phosphorus removal in this pilot plant in South Africa. And um, what I found was this release of phosphorus. But what was really happening was there was a dead zone connected to this second zone. Next slide. And that led, this is a, a diagram of what that pilot plant looked like. And there was a, a, a dead zone, but it was connected to the second inductive zone, and that served as a fermenter. And the results was extremely good. It was just a four stage plant for nitrogen removal, but the phosphorus coming in at nine to 10 milligram per liter was going out at less than 22 milligram per liter. Next slide, please. That led then to these configurations uh, that was. Uh, where we put the anaerobic zone up front. And on the right-hand side, you see a plant that was built on the site of the pilot plant, but near, didn't nearly achieve the same result as we did in the pilot plant. Next slide, please. That led to this construction of a number of large-scale plants in the US, in South Africa. And eventually, uh, next slide, please. The, um, Anko in Salt Lake City decided to take up the Bartonville pattern. I traveled to uh, Salt Lake City, as I said, worked with Dave Sensel, and we designed together this first plant in Palmetto, Florida, to achieve total nitrogen of three milligrams per liter and total P of only one milligram per liter. And that led to a working relationship that has lasted for more than 50 years. Next slide, please. And um, Dave then, uh, Anko also had the license for the carousel plant and Dave successfully married the Barnco and the carousel to form what you see in this slide here. And with extremely good results in terms of nitrogen removal. Um, the simultaneous nitrification, denitrification that was taking place in the carousel was augmented by the anoxic zone. And this plant here on the right hand side produced effluent total nitrogen of less than 1.7 milligram per liter over a five year period. Another one of the extensive legacy. Next slide, please. In the meantime, we discovered that we really need volatile fatty acids. And when I designed this, two plants in British Columbia. 
I decided that to ferment primary sludge and to augment the volatile fatty acids, but since that was going into the anaerobic zone, we bypassed most of the flow from the primary effluent to the anoxic zone. All this, this time I was discussing it with Dave. Next slide, please. And that led to the design of this plant where we fermentate from the primary sludge that's going into the anaerobic zone. Most of the primary effluent is bypassing until they just shut off the flow to the uh, primary effluent flow to the anaerobic zone. And that led to basically a side stream fermenter because now we have the return activated stuff going back into the anaerobic zone and we fed uh, the fermentate from the primary sludge in there. This plant performed extremely well. Next slide. And led us to the concept that where we decided, well, let's go ahead with this idea of site stream fermentation, which can take on various forms. In, a, in one form, it can lead to simply switching off anaerobic uh, mixers in the anaerobic zone and let the sludge settle on the end of the floor. And I worked with Dave on a plant like that too. And the other option is to take some of that sludge out of the anaerobic zone and ferment it and put it back in the anaerobic zone. And in the meantime, Lamb in North Carolina uh, patented the process in which he took some of the return activated sludge and fermented that and put it back in the system. And in Denver, Colorado, we did exactly that, but added some uh, fermentate from the primary sludge. And that really gave extremely good results in an MDD plant. Next slide, please. This is an example of a plant where, uh, in this particular plant, what you see on the right-hand side is the uh, uh, anoxic zones that was added and the anaerobic zone. And this plant worked extremely well because there was a lot of uh, volatile fatty acids in the inform, but then they added nitrate to the uh, collection system for odor control. And in that process, they destroyed the volatile fatty acids coming in and the plant stopped removing phosphorus. So what we did was to switch off a mixer in the anaerobic zone and that led to the effluent from the primary, from the secondary clarifier being around 0.1 milligram per liter phosphorus. And so far, we have seen great improvement in SBI when applying such a science implementation. I am showing this plant because I want to go on to other of David's sense of discovery. Next slide, please. Um, Dave Stencil got very interested in granule, granule formation in mainstream plants. And he produced, produced this uh, paper with uh, his uh, assistant professor, Professor Marie Riedler. And the next slide, please. And that plant that I've just shown, the Henderson plant, what they found uh, on this slide that I've, taken, I've taken from their paper, it shows the SVI 30 over SVI 15. If that is one, it means you have actually got granules instead of actually sludge. And so what you see this Henderson plant that I've shown is producing tremendous amount of, of granules. And so I was working with Dave to see what this, um, what, what was the reason for this granule formation. Next slide, please. Uh, here you see another plant where I work with Dave Sensel and Tom Coleman. It is a plant in Kashmir, Washington. And you can see on this left-hand side picture, you can actually see the granules that form. But the granules that formed in this case had um, filaments growing out of the granules. 
And my theory is that what happened here is as we went into the flood flow uh, aeration basin, we had high energy, we sheared off those filaments. And then at the end of the basin, we had selective wasting. We wasted from the top. And when we wasted from the top, we produced the plant of a form of pure granules. On the right hand side, you see the granules that was formed in that plant that I previously mentioned in Anderson. And uh, this picture is taken by the sensor. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. And lastly, uh, I was I designed this plant in British Columbia. I mean, sorry, in, in Kansas. And what we have is a on the left hand side picture here is an L shaped uh, anaerobic zone and 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 the side stream fermenter where we took ten percent of the mixed liquor, fermented it and returned it to the inlet. And on the, um, then that was followed by a noxic zone and the aeration zone of the carousel. Again, one of the they've sent some legacies. Uh, what you see on the on the middle picture here is the what it looked like in the carousel system. And what you really see here is granules with a layer of clear liquid on top. And this was the remarkable performance of this plant that you see on the right hand side, where the um, effluent orthophosphorus was below 0.1 milligram per liter, mostly 0.04 milligram per liter. But it also produced very clear effluent. And on the right hand side, you see the granules that was formed in the slide. We basically had pure granules, and the total suspended solids was like six milligrams per liter. And what really saddens me so is that this is the last discussion I had with Dave the, 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 the week before he died. We were still talking about the granular formation. And I, Dave to me was a sounding board. Next slide. And so in celebrating the, the, his legacy, next slide, please. His legacy, I want to say he was one of the giants at that time. And his work will live on for many generations yet. I was privileged to have known him and worked with him for most of his professional life. And I, to me, he was like a sounding board. And I still find myself saying, gee, I should discuss this with Dave. And his latest work on granulation ties in very well in this uh, webinar. Thank you very much. It's really an honor to have the opportunity to participate in this webinar in remembrance of uh, Dave Stencil. Uh, what we'd like to do is to share a little bit of the work that uh, we have done as a team to explore the opportunity for denitrifying polyphosphate accumulating organisms, for optimizing carbon usage for both denitrification and phosphorus removal. Really the focus in this project is on resource efficient, low carbon nitrogen and phosphorus uh, removal. Next slide, please. To give you a bit of background on, on this project, we're going to be telling you a bit about the work that we did as part of work project NTRY 13R16, understanding the impacts of low energy and low carbon nitrogen removal technologies on BioP and nutrient recovery processes. Uh, we had a very large <clears throat> project team, uh, including two universities, about seven utilities, and four uh, engineering consulting firms as well. And with um, this uh, excellent team of partners, we addressed three different research tracks. We focused on integrating resource efficient nitrogen removal processes with biological phosphorus removal through the activity of DPAOs. That's our focus for today. But we also focused on testing the limits of A stage high rate biological phosphorus removal, followed by a second stage of B stage shortcut nitrogen removal, for example, nitrification animox processes. And in a third uh, track, we focused on implementation of extractive resource recovery of phosphorus from water resource recovery facilities, performing both biological phosphorus and chemical phosphorus uh, removal. And again, we're going to be focusing on, on this first track, focusing on DPAOs. Next slide, please. Uh, but the overall goal of this project, the 
primary outcome that we targeted was successful full-scale implementation, broadly speaking, of carbon and energy efficient nitrogen removal with biological phosphorus removal in water resource recovery facilities with stringent nitrogen and phosphorus criteria across a variety of different geographic locations and process uh, configurations. Next slide, please. So um, what I would like to tell you about a bit first is some of the work that we did at lab scale, and then we'll progress to some of the work at pilot at full scale as well. Uh, but starting with some of the lab scale work and what we learned really a bit more on the fundamental side about uh, denitrifying polyphosphate accumulating organism uh, enriched uh, bioprocesses. We did this work in, uh, in my uh, lab here at uh, Northwestern. Uh, over uh, a number of years in uh, collaboration with Kartik Chandran and Krista Barbadillo and many other project partners with the overall objective of quantifying kinetics of phosphorus and nitrogen transformations by denitrifying accumulobacter PAO clades in the presence of different electron acceptors, including nitrate, nitrite, and nitrous oxide. In electron donors, we focus specifically on a couple of different VFAs, acetate and propionate. We also did quite a bit of work to assess propensity and mechanism for nitrous oxide production by DPAOs. I won't have time to go into detail about that today. Uh, and we also uh, characterized metabolic pathways and the ecology, the, the molecular microbial ecology of this consortium uh, as well. And again, I won't have time to go into detail about that today. A uh, little bit of nuts and bolts about our um, uh, experimentation. We used a lab scale reactor of a picture on screen here of this. We operated this for over three years. It's a 12 liter sequencing batch reactor that we cycled between anaerobic and aerobic phases. And the key thing I wanna point out is that these types of enrichment cultures have been used in the literature previously, uh, but the vast majority have focused on anaerobic aerobic cycling, so aerobic phosphorus accumulation, or in a limited number of cases, denitrifying polyphosphate with nitrate as the electron acceptor. The unique aspect of this study uh, was that we used nitrite as the electron acceptor, and that's important because that fits into our conception of nitrite as this key intermediate in shortcut nitrogen removal processes. So we're sort of mimicking influent from an upstream nitritation uh, reactor. If you could go to the next slide, please. So what did we learn from this system? Just at a high level, were we actually able to select for uh, our desired functional group, these polyphosphate accumulating organisms, this key uh, microbial class for um, removal and recovery of phosphorus. We're just looking at a bit of results from uh, DNA sequencing, 16S RNA amplicon sequencing to look at who's present in this reactor. Uh, what we found is that over time, very rapidly, we select, selected for on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see this orange bar that increases in abundance. That's Canadatus accumulobacter. So indeed, Canadatus accumulobacter was enriched uh, from about 2% up to about 50% of the community in about uh, three months. But of course, we're interested in the activity, what these accumulobacter are doing. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, what we found was that very consistently, if we evaluated the activity of the system, we saw very robust phosphorus un uptake under anoxic conditions with nitrite as the electron acceptor. We're just looking at two representative cycles. Uh, we could look at hundreds of additional cycles that look relatively similar, um, uh, but we're just looking at some representative cycles here on the left with propionate as the feed and on the right with acetate uh, as the feed. And in both cases, we're looking at time uh, within the cycle on the x-axis and then concentrations of a number of substrates and products on the y-axis. Most important um, uh, line to track here is the orange one, that's phosphate. And you can see that under anaerobic conditions, it is released as we would expect in a biological phosphorus removal reactor. And then under anoxic conditions, we see then uh, reuptake of that phosphate uh, with both uh, propionate and acetate as uh, feed. Now, if we look at kinetics of um, this uh, process, and we compare the kinetics of anoxic phosphorus uptake and aerobic phosphorus uptake, uh, the rates are approximately uh, the same. And so the key takeaway, broadly speaking, from this um, slide and from this body of work is that uh, we showed that a dedicated anoxic phase in the presence of nitrites, which again is the end product of nitritation, key link to shortcut nitrogen removal, with an extended SRT, we had about a 20-day SRT in the system, is sufficient to select for a specialized consortia of high rates denitrifying polyphosphate accumulating organisms. We also showed that these organisms had a strong kinetic preference for nitrite over nitrate 
I'm not, not showing that on screen, um, some additional data. Um, and we also finally showed that the anoxic phosphorus uptakes were not significantly different uh, in the presence of uh, propionate versus acetate. So not a clear preference for um, uh, different BFAs in the system. Uh, next slide, please. I won't go into great detail about our um, molecular microbiology results, but I did just want to mention that uh, we found what I think is some, some interesting diversity or microdiversity in uh, PAOs that were present in the system and that may be important in practice as well. That remains to be shown uh, in full-scale systems. Uh, using a metagenomic um, uh, genome-enabled metagenomics approach, we were able to recover near-complete genomes for three uh, types of accumulobacter. Uh, the first is type 1A, um, which has been reported in the literature previously. The second was more interesting. That's a type 1C. This is the first reported um, uh, genome for this particular clade of accumulobacter. And the most intriguing one, in my view, was the discovery of a potentially novel clade of accumulobacter that really hasn't been observed um, or reported in the literature before. This is a clade 1F accumulobacter that enriched over time in a reactor and that we think is putatively adapted to high rate denitrifying phosphorus uh, uptake. So I'll leave our, our uh, molecular microbiology results at that. And I want to emphasize these are promising and interesting results at lab scale in a highly enriched condition. But of course, in this project, we're interested in implementation and practice. And so we also wanted to look at pilot and full scale um, systems as well. And I'll turn the floor over to uh, my uh, partner, uh, Chris de Barbadillo, uh, to tell you a bit more about that work. Thank you, George. Um, as, as George mentioned earlier, uh, this we had the benefit on this project of a very broad and distributed project team that included work by a number of utilities at eight plants and testing 12 different configurations. Much of this was at full scale. Some of it was supported by pilot scale experiments. The uh, work also um, covered a broad number of configurations, including several BNR configurations, a plant with an oxidation ditch, an SBR, an integrated fixed film activated sludge system plant, and also several plants that were operating with hydrocyclones for external physical selection for uh, uh, denser settling particles. All of these experiments that were conducted by the utility research teams were specifically focused on their own utilities goals and addressing issues or, or planning work that was be, being done for future decisions and, and the future projects. However, there was a commonality between all of the tests in that everyone was quite interested in low energy, low carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus removal, and taking advantage of different mechanisms to uh, optimize performance and reduce uh, the use of resources. Next slide, please. So the first step really in um, taking some of the results from the different utilities and from these different experiments and, 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 and to try to look for some trends in, in the results and in performance, was to take a look at the effluent phosphorus removal performance statistics. So from each experiment or each utility, um, the effluent phosphorus results during their um, periods of testing were compiled and uh, 50th percentile, 91.7 percentile, and 99 percentile statistics were calculated. And so what we're showing here really is the 50th percentile as a general indicator of, of typical performance. And then we're looking at the ratio of 91.7 to 50 as kind of a maximum month type of indicator and the ratio of 99.7 to 50 as a maximum day type of indicator. And the reason for this was just to provide a little bit of insight into variability of performance. And a few, uh, a few th uh, themes emerged. One is that uh, a number of plants that operated at reduced DO and at low DO did achieve good phosphorus removal performance at, uh, at the lower DO concentrations. And so this included the Curie plant in Chicago, the O'Brien SBR plant that was also Chicago, the Ivy Mall plant in Denmark, 
uh, work at HRSD and then also the James Delorio plant in Colorado. At the Cary plant in Chicago, they were also able, as, as they did this at full scale in isolated trains, they were also able to characterize and track actual blower performance and energy usage and did find that they got the benefit that they were seeking of reduced energy costs at the lower DO, but did show slightly more variation in their um, uh, uh, phosphorus removal performance uh, as shown on the graph here. Another interesting result was at the Rock Creek plant in Oregon, uh, operated by Clean Water Services. And they found, uh, they tested side-by-side -side A2O configuration and side stream EBPR configuration. And what they found actually was that, that both configurations really provide a very good performance kind of on a average or median basis, but that there was more variability in the A2O system compared to the side stream EBPR system. Next slide, please. Another interesting result uh, uh, shown through in the phosphorus uptake activity tests that were performed under anoxic conditions. So a number of the utilities were able to uh, uh, conduct these assays um, uh, under anoxic conditions. So looking at phosphorus uptake in the presence, most of them in the presence of nitrate as the electron acceptor, and uh, then to compare that to the rate of phosphorus uptake under aerobic or oxic conditions. Under two of the tests, the anoxic tests, anox anoxic activity tests were able to be done both using nitrate and nitrite. And what was interesting here is these configurations were very different. One was the O'Brien SBR, the other was the IB Mall full scale oxidation ditch. Um, but what was interesting here is that the difference in the uptake rates were not uh, uh, very different between nitrate or nitrite as the electron acceptor. Although the difference in the uptake rates, anoxic uptake rates between the two configurations was in fact quite different um, uh, with the results at IB Mall being about double those at the, in the O'Brien pilot. Next slide, please. So additional comparison of the anoxic phosphorus uptake rate activity results were compiled uh, based on nitrate for all the facilities that, that performed this work. And uh, so, so what uh, we're showing here actually is a, a graph comparing the anaerobic SRT, the anoxic SRT, and then a ratio of the anoxic phosphorus uptake as a percent of the aerobic phosphorus uptake for each of, of the plants uh, that, that participated. And what was noted uh, was uh, perhaps a general trend toward the anoxic to oxic phosphorus uptake percentage or ratio being a bit higher in the systems that either had a longer anaerobic SRT or systems that had hydrocyclones. And so, so on that one, I point out the James River uh, plant, which really had very, very little anaerobic contact time, but it did have hydrocyclones and had a rather high um, uh, ratio of anoxic phosphorus uptake to the aerobic as observed. Next, next slide, please. Showing a bit more detail of the results from uh, the team at the Rock Creek plant in Oregon, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they performed side-by-side -side testing of A2O and side stream EBPR configurations. Both treatment trains were operating in A2O mode and an initial set of uh, uh, phosphorus uptake rate tests were conducted. Um, then the two systems were isolated. The conventional configuration uh, maintained operation in A2O. The two basins were isolated and the second basin was operated with a side stream EBPR type of configuration, which uh, included RAS only in the first anaerobic zone. And over a period of about six months, it was noticed that the anoxic uptake rates in the A2O system, if anything, started to drop while the anoxic uptake rates and the ratio as percentage of, of, of aerated uh, uptake rates was increasing in the system that was operating in the side stream EVPR configuration. 
And so uh, these basins were operated identically and are um, uh, of the same basin design. And so the main difference between the two configurations was the fact that the mass fraction, the anaerobic mass fraction or SHRT was higher in the side stream EVPR configuration, um, which showed the higher uh, anoxic uptake rates. Next slide, please. And so uh, uh, moving on uh, to, to a, a bit more discussion about the plants operating with hydrocyclones, several of these also seem to have some of the higher anoxic phosphorus uptake values. And honestly, uh, the, these plants uh, uh, had quite a few differences between each other in terms of configuration and operation, um, but uh, except that they all had hydrocyclones. And so, for example, the James River treatment plant that I mentioned earlier is uh, really uh, an IFAS uh, 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 primarily uh, oriented toward nitrification and nitrogen removal with a very short anaerobic contact time uh, as the uh, streams come together. In addition to that, at the time during the testing, the zones with the uh, media, the biofilm media, were quite highly aerated and the uh, suspended growth SRT is, is fairly short. So, that, so that's one configuration. The IB Mole plant in Denmark has high anaerobic and anoxic fractions and operated an oxidation ditch with alternating aeration at lower DOs. The James Delorio plant uh, in Colorado was operating with low DO and uh, uh, ABN controls, so it's so advanced controls to try to um, uh, optimize aeration and, and nutrient removal performance. They also had hydrocyclones. Another observation that we made is that uh, at the Denver uh, plant, at the, at the uh, Robert Height plant, they were able to run a full-scale uh, isolated demonstration train uh, in an AO mode and then change that operation over to AO with hydrocyclones. And uh, this, uh, after this switch was made, um, an increase in PAO relative abundance was observed in the train that was operating with hydrocyclones. So, and so another interesting result. And so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to my uh, colleague, Kartik Chandran to talk more about the uh, uh, microbial ecology results. Okay, thank you very much, Chris and George. Uh all right. Uh, I'd like to start out also by acknowledging that this is it's really a it's really an honor for for us all to uh, to present our work uh, in honor again of uh, of uh, Professor David Stenskill. Uh, Dave was really a close friend to me and a, and a really strong supporter and mentor. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, I'm happy to share some of our work here. So as uh, as Chris and George have already mentioned, this project has been really a remarkable confluence of different directions, different stakeholders, different uh, partners from across sectors, academia, utilities, uh, practitioners, and so on. So what I'm here to share uh, today is uh, are the results of uh, a more, uh, a deeper molecular characterization of the full-scale treatment plants that, uh, that Chris just presented. And this also ties into some of the more fundamental work that George had presented previously. And so here, first, we are showing uh, uh, the results of uh, a very detailed uh, interrogation of uh, different full-scale treatment plants that Chris had mentioned. So to complement what Chris mentioned uh, in terms of what the, what the plants did, and that is to monitor performance and kinetics through batch experiments, the, the, the overall efficiency of uh, conversion, the kinetics, what we did was we went into the black box of these systems to, to try and answer three questions. What kind of organisms are there? So who is there and how many to an extent? And then more importantly, uh, what it is that they are capable of doing. So this is the potential activity. And then under the conditions that these plants were being operated, uh, what were these different groups of organisms actually doing? And so that is the progression that I'm going to take you through today. And uh, on this slide, what we are presenting are answers to the first question in these different plants. So if you look at the schematic, if you look at the graph, on the x-axis, we have the different configurations uh, summarized or laid out. And on the y-axis, we have the relative abundance based on, uh, uh, on the results of a technique that is uh, referred to as uh, metagenomics. So essentially what we are doing is we are going in, 
taking out all the DNA and sequencing all the DNA with the with with one objective here, uh, uh, more to follow on the next slide. One objective here is to figure out what kind of organisms there are, who is there, and how many. And as you can see across, if you just take a step back and take a look at the overall profile here, what we are able to see is that the you know that the 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 fingerprint of the different organisms or the different groups, uh, the different genera, uh, based on metagenomic sequencing, is nearly identical. So, irrespective of how these different treatment plants were configured or operated. Uh, we did observe a similar overall microbial community structure. So who's there, how many, and so on. And this is especially uh, the case when we talk about the dominant nitrogen and phosphorus cycling organisms, which is really the focus of this, of this project. So again, irrespective of how these plants were configured or run, uh, the overall microbial structure, the fingerprint of the structure is nearly identical. The dominant nitrogen cycling organisms here we found across the board uh, in terms of ammonia oxidizing bacteria were related to nitrous ammonia species. And for nitride oxidation, the dominant uh, groups were related to nitrous spirus species. And then for the phosphorus cycling organisms, we have candidatus accumulibacter species, again, representing the bulk of the uh, DNA signatures. Next slide, please. So now we go deeper. It's, uh, if you want to understand not just who is there, how many, but what it is that they are capable of doing, so the potential function. We look at the same DNA pool that we extracted. And now the question is, what kind of different reactions, what kind of different metabolic pathways do these, do these groups of organisms possess? Not what, it, what they're doing, that's coming up on the next slide, but what it is that they can do, potentially do, what is it that they, that they possess? So on the left-hand circle, I'm showing you the different reactions of the nitrogen cycle, uh, most of the nitrogen cycling reactions. And on the right-hand circle, we have some of the key reactions representing uh, phosphorus uptake on the bottom half of the circle, and then generally speaking, phosphorus release uh, on, the, on the right hand, on the top portion of the circle. So if we focus on the nitrogen cycle, the, the principal reactions of, uh, that we are considering based on what we found on the last slide, who's there? So we're talking about conventional ammonia to nitride oxidation, nitride to nitrate oxidation. So that's what is represented by, by these different uh, pathways. So the first step of ammonia oxidation catalyzed by ammonia monooxygenase, AMO, and then, and so on and so forth. So that's that's what we track from ammonia to nitrite to nitrate. And then on the denitrification side, we are tracking nitrate to nitride, nitrate, nitrite to nitric oxide, nitrous oxide, and nitrogen gas. The way to read all of these schematics is as follows. Uh, we are looking for a fingerprint of each of these genes as represented by the, 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 the intensity of the blue color. And so if, for instance, if we just look at that AMO rectangle, uh, again, we are tracking all the different plants we find AMO present in all of these plants. And that is to be expected. If plant is nitrifying or even capable of nitrifying, we expect the signature and that's what we are seeing. And we are not seeing really any plants where any of the big steps are missing in the nitrogen cycle. Again, no surprises, but it's good to actually confirm this. On the phosphorus side, it's a similar story. Uh, we're looking at uh, four genes here, PPK, PST, PAP and PPX. Again, uh, we can talk about functions uh, in a bit more detail. But, uh, but essentially, broadly speaking, generally speaking, we have uh, divided them into uh, pathways associated generally with uptake and release of phosphorus. Again, the, the bottom line is as follows. For all the different treatment plants that we consider, the signatures are there, so the potential is there. So there's nothing really missing from that perspective. And so that's what we say when we summarize complete pathways for nitrogen and phosphorus cycling were present across the board at all facilities despite differences in how these plants are configured uh, or operated. Next slide, please. And now this is the more exciting uh, result as well. It's not just who is there, how many, but it, it's actually what it is they're actually doing. So this it takes some explaining to do now. So if you just take a look at the schematic, the, the, what we're trying to do is, we are, see the, the biomass is all uh, uh, there, but the, the biomass is actually circling round and round the different uh, zones of any given wastewater treatment plant. And these could be anaerobic, anoxic, or aerobic. And so the way to, one way to summarize this information is by looking at the expression of these genes. So now we are talking about RNA, messenger RNA specifically. We are looking at the expression of these genes as the biomass goes from one zone to another. The way we have expressed this is as follows. If a gene if the expression of the gene, a given gene, or the messenger RNA corresponding to a diff, uh, of a given gene, increases as we go from uh, as we go uh, into an aerobic zone or an aerated zone, uh, or alternately, 
if the expression of a given gene or a pathway is higher in the aerobic zone compared to an anaerobic zone or aerobic anoxic zone, uh, that uh, signal will be represented in a red, uh, through a red arrow, if you can look at, uh, if you can look at the arrows, uh, and then vice versa for the green arrows. So let's take another look at what it is that we're trying to explain here. So for nitrification, so for nitrification, we're looking at ammonia to nitrite, nitrite to nitrate. What do we expect? What do we expect in terms of the activity of these organisms, expression of these pathways as these organisms are in an aerobic zone? We, we expect an increase in the aerobic zone relative to a decrease. That's exactly what we're finding if you track, the, if you track on the left-hand circle, the red arrow. So we are seeing that the nitrification-related pathways are expressed at a higher level in the aerobic zone compared to the anoxic zone. And that's exactly what we expect. And this is now relating not just to who is there, how many are there, it's actually what are these organisms doing? And we are doing- Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, George and Kartika uh, for sharing a wonderful work you've done. We're gonna move on to the next panelist. Uh, it's Dr. Yumei Li, who is the chair and the professor at the Tongji University. Uh, professor Li, please. Okay. So uh, it's my honor to be here to talk about uh, my work on EBPR and uh, phosphorus recovery. Here, I want to uh, introduce a side stream process designed for nutrient removal and uh, phosphorus recovery. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so here we use a, a domestic, a synthetic domestic uh, waste water, and uh, we set the SRT from 25 days to 50 days, and also for the P recovery rate from 40 percent to 60. 5% and we find that uh, at a higher uh, P recovery, we can have a higher SRT to maintain the P content in sludge around 5% so that to keep the EBPR activities. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also use the real waste uh, water uh, and uh, to have the similar results here, we can see that uh, this for the purple, uh, this purple color uh, is uh, recovered phosphorus. And here the stage one and stage two, they are the AAO process. And then we shift to the, uh, the side stream process uh, with the different anoxic uh, uh, tank volumes. And we can get a very good phosphorus recovery and also keeps the uh, P content in sludge around 4%. Uh, in the supernatant, we can have a phosphorus phosphate around uh, in the range of six, uh, 30 to 70 milligram per liter. Next slide, please. Uh, so here you can see uh, is a um, P recovery uh, process is combined with the AAO process. And we actually dispatch a part of return sludge to the uh, this SBR uh, tank in the side stream. And then that's there for uh, the anaerobic fermentation for some, for a few, for a few hours. And then phosphorus can be released. So then in the next tank, we can let the uh, phosphorus recovered as HAP, hydroxyapatite. And after the P is recovered, the supernatant will be returned to the uh, anaerobic tank. Uh, then uh, in another tank uh, after the uh, sludge, in the this SBR this, uh, side stream SBR tank, the sludge will be returned to the anoxic tank. Uh, so uh, here uh, we recover the phosphorus and uh, also uh, the uh, part of sludge, the carbon in the sludge can be uh, released as VFA and uh, therefore the sludge back to the anoxic tank to uh, provide uh, a sludge fuller for uh, PHA. Okay, next slide, please. 
so we hope that using this side stream P recovery process to recover about 60% uh, of phosphorus from the influent and uh, uh, also we hope that the phosphorus concentration in the side stream super supernatant higher than 50 milligram per liter so that it's easy to be recovered and uh, th this side stream need to combine with the EDTR process so that we can have many P in the supernatant but uh, usually uh, if we recover phosphorus in the side stream process, and maybe there's some negative effects. Uh, the uh, extraction of phosphorus from the sludge may cause the lower uh, P content in activated sludge, and uh, maybe also uh, lead to the depletion of the poly P in biomass, and thus may damage the EBPR process. Next slide, please. Uh, so, we uh, correlate uh, P recovery rate with SRT and uh, also the P content in sludge. Uh, so we, we have this uh, equation, uh, just uh, link SRT and uh, R is the uh, P recovery rate and uh, uh, here PS is the P content in sludge. So here, uh, these two figures show that uh, uh, if we want to uh, maintain a uh, constant uh, P content in the sludge uh, and uh, recover a higher uh, phosphorus from the influent, we need to have a higher SRT. And also the right color show that uh, the higher the influent uh, phosphorus concentration in the uh, and the uh, uh, the, 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 high, the higher phosphorus recovery rate we can get at a, a constant SRT. Uh, we're using an experiment to have this equation validated. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, it, next slide. Ah, yes, here. And uh, the, uh, also, we can see that from the AAO to the AAO SBSPR process with the uh, increase of SRT, uh, we get a reduction of the excess sludge. So uh, also the uh, sludge yield. Uh, when the SRT increased to 50 days, it resulted in a 58% of sludge reduction. Uh, so this process, that means this process can also uh, reduce the sludge production. Next, next slide, please. Uh, we also uh, have uh, did, uh, done the uh, pilot scale operation uh, in which the uh, total influence, um, influent phosphorus is lower than the uh, lab scale experiment. Uh, and uh, we can have a around the, um, more than 40% of phosphorus recovery. And uh, also in the side stream, we have uh, released the uh, phosphorus concentration around 50 milligram per liter. Uh, also the P content in the sludge is still can around 5%. So it can keep the EBPR activity. And um, okay, next slide. So here is the uh, uh, phosphorus removal efficiency and the total nitrogen efficiency. We can see that the total phosphorus efficiency is not uh, influenced by the P recovery. And uh, uh, also for the total nitrogen removal, uh, compared with the AAO process, the side stream process even have a higher total nitrogen uh, removal efficiency. Uh, especially have an, uh, at the higher SRT and the higher phosphorus recovery rate. Uh, next slide, please. So from the uh, stoichiometric and uh, uh, kinetics of the system, we can see that the uh, phosphorus release rate is not actually uh, influenced very much by the P recovery and the extended uh, SRT. Uh, when the SRT increased from 25 days to 50 days, uh, uh, all the AOSBSPR process have a, 
a good phosphorus release rate. Next uh, slide, please. Um, also, we can see that when the systems switched from the AAO process to the side stream process, we, we can have a, a much better denitrifying P removal. And uh, uh, from the uh, stored metric, we can see that uh, the maximum anoxic uh, P uptake rate actually uh, increased uh, much better compared with the AAO process. And also the uh, denitrifying up rate increased. And uh, with the, uh, the higher the side stream biomass, we have a higher ratio of anoxic uh, P uptake to the aerobic uh, uptake. Next slide. Okay, so uh, here is a take home message is that uh, based on the phosphorus mass balance equation, uh, if we extend the SRT of the side stream process, it can increase the potential of phosphorus recovery and reduce the impact of phosphorus recovery on the P content of the activated sludge and keep the EBPR activities. Uh, the second is uh, denitrifying P uptake was improved in the side stream process. And uh, thus we have a higher total nitrogen removal. Uh, the microbial community structure was changed significantly compared with the AAO process. Uh, and the important fun functional bacteria, uh, for example, the nitrifiers and denitrifiers, PAO, especially BPAO, they are all enriched in the AAO SBS class process. The challenge of the process is that it is more complicated compared with the AO process. And therefore, more sophisticated control of the process is required. OK, that's all. Thanks for your um, attendance. Next slide. Yeah. Uh, so uh, next slide, have a look at the microbial community uh, analysis. Uh, so from the um, Oats and the kills and the ACES indexes, we can see that the uh, microbial richness of the side stream process increased significantly compared with the AAO process. And also the diversity, uh, the microbial diversity uh, increased. Uh, next, uh, please. So if we focus on the um, PAOs uh, in the side stream process, we find that the relative abundance of candidate acne vector was uh, not uh, affected by the phosphorus recovery and uh, the extended SRT. And uh, uh, even though the uh, acne vector in the side stream process actually uh, increased uh, significantly compared with the AAO process. Uh, other PAOs such as uh, tetrosferol and uh, dichloromonas also uh, presented, and especially that the dichloromonas is uh, much in, enriched in the side stream process compared with the AAO process. Next uh, slide, please. So if we uh, look at the uh, nitrogen metabolism pathways, and uh, we find that uh, from the abundance of the KEGG modules subject to the nitrogen metabolism pathway, we find that the, uh, actually the denitrifying pathway, uh, it is strengthened after the system switched from the AL process to the uh, side stream process. And particularly, uh, so the, uh, also the data show that the side stream pr process could improve the denitrifying P uptake by promoting the growth of candidate accumulated factors. Next slide, please. Great, thanks, April. Um, I'll try and be a little quick. I know we're a little behind on time. Um, to introduce what I want to share about, I'll show you the schematic of a pilot system we ran at HRSD for about three years. 
Uh, and of course, the, the ideas that help build and, and inspire the system, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants like Dave. Um, this, this system is an AB process. So we do carbon capture and removal and then um, nitrogen removal in the B stage. So for the nitrogen removal step, we do uh, intermittent aeration with AVN control to get a, a mixture of NOx and ammonia that we can then send to a downstream Animox polishing process. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the way to do Animox here, you know, ideally, or what we intended is the intermittent aeration and aggressive SRT control can hopefully lead to NOB out selection or in the Animox reactor itself, we can add supplemental carbon to do PDNA, uh, partial denitrification Animox. Uh, the big drawback to a system like this is that you can't do BioP because you've removed the readily available carbon and especially the VFA and the influence in your A stage. And the A stage SRT is too short to do BioP. So to uh, try and add BioP to the system, we added a side stream bio P reactor, that's this SBPR here. And we added a fermenter for some of the carbon we've captured in the A stage. You know, we take some of that WAS and we ferment it to get a VFA rich fermentate that we add into this side stream reactor. So, you know, big picture, this is, this is capturing the carbon out of the process. So you can have a much smaller nutrient removal piece, the B stage. And then we can put that carbon back where we want it. <laughs> so uh, just big picture, this system works and it works well and it's, it's quite stable. Um, as long as you add enough VFA from that fermented A stage WAS, uh, you can get really low uh, effluent OPs. So here in these figures, you see the VFA to P or the C to P ratios. Uh, and this is what we added in terms of fermentate. Uh, and the effluent OP on the y-axis. So you can see above a certain amount of VFA or soluble COD, we get very consistent effluent OPs under 0.5. And even as we increase the amount of carbon we're adding to very high levels, uh, we don't see any deterioration of the bio P performance. That leads into the next point, which is that that additional carbon appears to be very useful for uh, nitrogen removal as well. So these are endogenous denitrification batch tests we did. So we take a sludge sample from the end of the aerobic zone. So there shouldn't be any uh, soluble carbon around and we don't add any carbon either. And then we measure a denitrification rate. So the Y axis here is that denitrification rate and the X axis is that VFA to P ratio. The, the big takeaway is that these rates are much, much higher than you would expect from endogenous denitrification. Uh, which, you know, maybe is one to 2.5 milligrams of NOx per liter per hour. And, and here we're seeing um, 2.5 to 5 to, to up to 10 even. And you can see this rate increases as we add more carbon. So what that means is there's significant carbon storage going on in the system. And that benefits us with a bunch of extra TIN removal. And it's not at the expense of the BioP we're doing. Uh, that carbon storage uh, can also lead to uh, partial denitrification. So this is a period of about uh, five or six months of operation where we have this happening. And here's just a profile in time from the system. And you can see in the gray, we have the air that's turning on and off because it's intermittently aerated. And there's nitrite accumulating while the air is uh, turned off. So we're getting nitrite accumulation in the system which is great for the Animox downstream. And it's not from NOB out selection, it's from partial denitrification. And we see that in this um, profile. We also did some uh, additional work in our group and, oh, this is not shown up on here, shoot. Uh, but, uh, so we did some additional, uh, you know, metagenomic work and, and we did these batch tests where we measured bulk PHA and glycogen, that's shown in the orange and green here in this batch test where nitrite's accumulating, and that's only with internally stored carbon, no exogenous carbons. Uh, and, and we did single cell Raman microspectroscopy, you know, on those samples. And we found that um, there's three OTUs uh, really present in this system. Uh, and um, I'm sorry, three OPUs. And in, uh, in OPU1, this major cluster, we found that in those cells, PHA decreased over time as nitrite was accumulating and there was no uh, glycogen in, in any of those OPUs. 
So that led us to conclude that uh, PHA was driving this uh, internal carbon storage and partial denitrification and not glycogen. And those OPUs or that OPU1 uh, likely related to the OTUs for either an acinetobacter or promomonodesae. Um, we also saw that that partial denitrification really drove uh, high TIN removal in the, in the Animox process downstream. So again, you know, we designed the system to do NOB out selection to get the nitrite, or we add carbon in the Animox reactor to do partial denitrification Animox. Here, what we were able to do is do the partial denitrification step in the B stage, in the activated sludge portion, then we have a bunch of ammonia and nitrite coming out of there, and that Animox just uh, knocks out the rest of the nitrogen. So very quickly, this figure is showing nitrite accumulation ratio as a percentage in this black line. And then the, in, the nitrogen removal percentage in the B stage that's in blue and the MBVR in red. So you can see, you know, we're, we're doing 50% nitrogen removal in the B stage, and then another 30% nitrogen removal with no extra carbon added in the MBBR just because of all that nitrogen there. So it's an, an incredibly efficient process. Uh, and it wasn't exactly how we designed it, but if you can drive partial denite with this internal carbon storage, it's a huge benefit. Um, I'll leave you with this last figure, which is just a very broad sketch of, you know, carbon. It's a sand key diagram showing carbon flows in a typical A2O and, and in our pilot process. And the, the broadest thing I'll say about this is, is that, um, you know, the AV process, these side stream processes, this focus on internal carbon storage, uh, we're really unlocking tools to take carbon and instead of dealing with it in the influent, you know, remove it and put it where we want it in the most useful places. And, and it's, it's huge for, for BioP, for nitrogen removal and for uh, mainstream Animox. So thank you. Thank you, Caster. Uh, our next panelist is Stephanie Klaus. Uh, she's a process engineer working at uh, HRSD, uh, and she's also uh, leading uh, several R&D projects, including the partial denitrification full-scale demonstration. Stephanie, go ahead. Thanks, April. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lee. Our next uh, panelist is uh, uh, Caster uh, McCullen, and uh, he's currently working with uh, Hampson Road Sanitary Dist District. And also, I'm fortunate to be involved in associated with him as advisor, uh, as him as a PhD candidate right now at Cornell University. Caster, go ahead. Thank you. So, um, you know, we've observed this phenomenon in some of our other plants, especially the VIP plant here. This is showing how low the methanol dose is below expectation at our VIP plant. And we basically have stopped dosing methanol entirely here because we have this internally stored carbon um, in our second anoxic zone. So, and we are seeing nitrate accumulation there. So it would be great if we could just, you know, drop in some moving media or drop in some fixed media modules and do partial denitrification animox in, you know, some of our other facilities, um, which really saves on carbon and we can also let us bleed through some ammonia from the aerobic zone. So that's uh, energy and caustic savings as well. Um, so that's, that's it for my presentation. Thank you, Stephanie. All right. So um, I'm going to be focusing on um, full scale plant today. We're going to be talking about James River treatment plant. So while we were doing the work that Kester just presented on at the pilot, simultaneously, we were noticing full scale at many of our different plants, this same um, phenomenon. In our plants that had a second anoxic zone, we were noticing we didn't have to dose as much carbon as we thought we would have to, um, you know, below stoichiometric requirements. Um, so we were really, we then investigating this further, we found that it was internally stored carbon that gets, that gets carried through the process. So at James River, um, Chris presented on this plant earlier. Uh, at, at some point, we added an anaerobic zone here. So it's an A2O currently. So we have anaerobic, anoxic, and then um, an aerobic IFAS zone. Then there's a very small second anoxic zone that we traditionally have not added external carbon and a very small, even smaller reaeration zone. So we need to meet um, some stricter nitrogen limits here in the future because we are um, adding a water reuse system on the tail end of this plant. So our plans for doing this are either, um, we're probably gonna do both. 
Um, but the options are to add IFAS in a second anoxic zone here, which is really small. Um, and we want to do partial denitrification anamox. Um, so we'll have anamox here as attached growth in the second anoxic zone and as a uh, polishing step as well. Um, we probably could have just picked one of these options, but because we're still piloting and testing, we're going with both to be, to be conservative. Regardless of where um, you're doing the um, partial denitrification anamox, the, it's really important to control the ammonia versus NOx um, aeration control. So we need the ammonia and um, NOx to be uh, approximately equal um, going into this zone to meet anamox stoichiometry. So in order to study both of these options, we have a pilot. Uh, we've been operating for a couple of years now. Um, both IFAS option and um, MBBR option. So MBBR receives um, secondary clarifier effluent, IFAS receives the mixed liquor from the main plant. Um, what we found was that mainstream Animox took a uh, startup, took about three months. This was good news. We've grown Animox from scratch um, in about four or five startups now. So we're not concerned about growing Animox from scratch. And once Animox is there, it's not the limiting factor. Um, and we're able to meet low effluent TIN limits as long as we meet that upstream ammonia versus NOx ratio. Uh, the, I, we had more experience with the MBBR at the time, but we found that IFAS is also a viable option. And this is exciting news for us because we have nine um, medium-sized plants, some of which, you know, five more at HRSD, which have a second anoxic zone where we could potentially just add Animox and do partial denitrification anamox in that second zone. And um, lastly, we found that IFAS can take advantage of internally stored carbon. So using internally stored carbon to do that first step of taking nitrate to nitrite and then anamox taking um, ammonia and nitrite to nitrogen gas. So here's an example. Um, this is the, on the, the blue is the MBBR, the gray is IFAS phase one, where we were adding um, less carbon, trying to meet a lower effluent limit, I mean, sorry, a higher effluent limit. And then the green was phase two, where we were trying to push that a little bit. And I think the main takeaway here is just in gray, you can see this COD to N around one is really low, considering for methanol, we might um, you know, expect this ratio to be 4.8. Um, for full denight and maybe half of that for uh, partial. So we're really under that expectation there. And you can see that there's really not too much difference between the affluent TIN removed between phase one and phase two. You're getting maybe an additional one milligram per liter in phase two, but we're um, really able to take advantage in the gray of this internally stored carbon. And why that's interesting is that it's really getting carried, remember this is getting carried through the whole aerobic process. So this carbon is getting stored in the anaerobic zone, getting carried through the aerobic zone, and then being used for partial denite in the second anoxic. And here's just some example of the rates. The top is a nitrate removal rate, the bottom is nitrite um, accumulation rate, where we see sort of this preference for partial denitrification. Um, the endogenous rate is really in quotes, um, you know, endogenous just meant that we didn't add external carbon. So this is really above just what we think of from, um, from decay. This, this, is, uh, this has to be from some internally stored carbon and we have other tests to, to prove that it is from internally stored carbon that aren't shown here. Um, but yeah, this is just with glycerol and methanol. And um, at the time for part of this experiment, we were adding glycerol on the main plant um, but some, some of this time we, we were not, um, but you can see that glycerol gives the, probably the best nitrite accumulation rate, uh, in, on the bottom graph, but that in the dark blue, you can see that we still get like some good nitrite accumulation, even without adding any external carbon at all. So this is great news. We want to take advantage of this. Um, now we're doing, uh, we did the pilot. Now we're doing a full scale demonstration on two of the nine tanks. So here are the nine <clears throat> aeration tanks. Uh, we're converting two trains to fit in this second, small second anoxic zone where the HRT is about 20 minutes. We're going to fit in um, two demonstrations, one fixed media and one um, moving media. 
so we can grow Animox there and do partial denitrification Animox with um, methanol as the carbon source. The trying to decide between the two while we're doing the demonstration, uh, moving media is you know more tried and true, and it's really a better choice for wet weather management. Um, I mean, sorry, it's the more challenging for wet weather management because we have to add screens, which increases head loss. So um, we need to have a wet weather bypass around the moving media zone. It would be nice if we could do the fixed media. Um, this is what the modules are going to look like here on the top and we're using a fabric. The fixed media is great for a retrofit because we can just drop this in any second anoxic zone, grow Animox on it and do partial denitrification Animox. Um, but traditionally this, you know, there aren't a lot of anoxic applications of fixed um, media options. And also you have to be able to control, it's harder to control the biofilm thickness on, um, on fixed media instead of um, plastic moving media. I want to touch upon uh, uh, quickly a concept that Lee's uh, actually motivated uh, the, the study related to the uh, site stream EBPR is actually the requirement of carbon ratio uh, to achieve a stable EBPR. It's well recognized that in practice that we require certain level or minimum uh, carbon to P ratio for us to achieve the stable EBPR. Uh, many studies has, has explored the fundamental reason. Uh, one of them is related to the carbon computation among PAOs, GAOs, as well uh, as others. And we know in most ways, what you remember, at least in, uh, North, in Europe and the States, most treatment plants having a range of 10 to 40, and in that range is unavoidably you're always going to have PAOGO coexistence. So therefore, carbon computation cannot be avoided. So under this con consideration and understanding, how can we better control the carbon to make it maximized to, 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 uh, to achieve the goal we want? It's actually the key, particularly in response to uh, the uh, EBPR side. We know that low influence C2P often lead to unstable and fluctuation. And also, if you want to implement any process such as AB stage, you want to capture carbon, or want to capture carbon to optimize downstream shortcut and remove Animox, you have to address the carbon needs uh, for the uh, for the bio P process. So I think the thinking how we can better do this uh, it's uh, warranted. And one of the particular uh, uh, direction uh, our group have been involved in working with many in one of the WARF funded project with many agencies, including into uh, looking how potentially uh, the design and operation strategy related to the side stream EBPR can help achieve along that uh, direction. So this particular configuration actually is not really new. Uh, it was practiced in Denmark and Europe for a while uh, with at the time, the motivation actually to enhance the nitrification. And we actually look at from a little bit of different angle, try to see how this particular strategy and design can be better leveraged to enhance and improve the stability of EBPR without external carbon addition. And we have learned uh, through uh, this effort that uh, this particular configuration by simply uh, taking a small portion of the RAS through a side stream uh, semi or first half of the fermentation to enhance VFE production, but with minimized mesenogens actually provide a, a suite of advantages, including influence the carbon fluctuation independent, uh, P removal, it therefore is more stable, more controlled and efficient uh, anaerobic zone, as well as more flexible uh, implementation. So this particular study was done uh, across um, 12 facilities, including some facilities were able to pilot to side stream, some using conventional. And uh, through three years of monitoring of the data, we learned that indeed, uh, plant implemented a variety of side stream configuration led to uh, more stable performance. Of course, uh, you also have to consider the, the permit and other factors potentially impacting, but nevertheless, the statistics indeed show that the side stream implementation uh, improved the overall performance. And of course, with more mechanistic that combines genomics and modeling, um, we also get some insight to learn that, that the particular uh, strategy will allow to have a higher diversity, uh, more rich microbial community. And uh, our study, as well as previous panel that George and others also showed that the uh, population potential selection of a specific organism associated with this uh, strategy. So it means that this particular change of the operation indeed leads to fundamental changes uh, in the ecology and the system. 
And I want to touch upon a, a, a little bit of the key things related to how potentially citric meat PPR can be further leveraged to uh, maximize the carbon usage. So particularly related to, to carbon, we know that for Cytostream that with in situ carbon production, not only increase the amount of that available to a bio P process, but it's actually provide a more complex carbon mixture that has a intrinsic implications on the PAO, GAO computation, uh, kinetics, as well as the uh, carbon diversion or carbon distribution among different populations. And we learned that this process actually can optimize the carbon utilization, directing carbon to more favorable over GAO, uh, to PAOs over uh, GAO, and also through better and more controlled condition in the site stream in relative to the traditional A2O design. It also allow us to uh, have more flexibility to divert the carbon as the case demonstrated by Kester in the AB stage and the PN PNA or PDNA process combined with the site stream. So overall, I think that there are a number of parameters and aspects related to this particular concept, and not necessarily to this, like I mentioned, this particular side stream, but could it be along this way of thinking, how can we put in more strategies to make the internal carbon use uh, more efficient? Therefore, reducing the overall carbon footprint. I think that there are suites of evidence, including those presented earlier today, uh, as well as those I'm not again chance to present today, but in the literature, that how potential side stream EPR can enable more flexible and improve the carbon utilization. And one example mentioned earlier is AB state side stream plus the shortcut uh, presented earlier. And also uh, here, I uh, borrowed the, uh, the, the study done by um, uh, Metro of Chicago and provided candidly by Cindy Chin. They also showed that by implementing side stream with a very unfavorable low carbon condition, which was not possible to, to sustain BioP, but now with side stream in BPR, now they can do the essence that actually reduced the carbon demand and the carbon loading requirement. And also uh, I think uh, evidence presented today as well as other study also showed that the uh, site stream uh, EBPR potentially also enhance internal carbon driven denitrification. Therefore also that's done through multiple directly, of course, by having the site stream, you already uh, allow more influent carbon directly go through the anoxic zone. So therefore intrinsic that strategy already, already would allow more carbon go to denitrification. But in addition to that, I think that there's more room to be explored on how the side stream potentially uh, encourage more population that has stored more higher statistic amount of carbon uh, than conventional system allow and how we can better use that. One of particular evidence, I just want to share one here really quick, is uh, uh, through the, uh, uh, the, the, the strategy to look at the statistically intracellular, cellular level carbon polymer, uh, carbon storage shift change, we can find that actually side stream uh, system actually really allows statistically significant improve and in increase of internal carbon storage in not only P PAOGO as well as unknown and unrecognized uh, organisms. So at the very last, um, just touch upon one slide, uh, go back to the DPAO concept, the previous uh, several panelists uh, touched upon on the role of DPAO. I think concept-wise, DPAO does, would help us, uh, allow us to better use the internal carbon for both uh, N and P removal purposes. Uh, but I want to touch upon just one point is that um, we have to carefully look at how much contribution DPAO makes versus other organisms. In this particular study, it's a lab skill study with different recycle ratio to allow different amount of nitrate being recycled back to the anoxic zone, which led to a different level of enrichment of DPAO versus non-DPAO based on what so far we know. And it turned out that the DPAO can be easily enriched by just the increased the, um, nitrate recycle ratio as expected. And, uh, but more importantly, um, I think the key point I want to uh, touch upon at an end through uh, sumo modeling uh, as well as computation, uh, we can see that under three different nitrate recycle ratio, when the system have a different level of DPAO versus um, uh, non-DPAO, you can see that the overall contribution to denitrification by TP DPAO is somewhere in the range from five to 10%. That means majority, majority of deep, uh, the denitrification are carried out by conventional heterotrophic denitrifier as well as other internal carbon driven denitrifier, therefore lead uh, a lot of room for us to explore further. 
So with that, I want to thank you uh, all the students who contribute to the information I presented here today, um, including uh, PhD student Nick uh, Guangyu, visiting scholar uh, Dr. Wan, who is professor now in Xi'an University of Technology, uh, and the previous uh, uh, student, uh, Nering, and the postdoc and Van Ru right now with a consulting firm, and as well as all the participating agencies and uh, facility to make the study possible. Thank you. So with that, I think we're going to transit into the panel discussion and the Q&A section. So now I'm going to move in, uh, to the uh, final um, panelist. Um, that's me. And hopefully I can wrap up some of the key points presented uh, by a number of panelists at today's uh, talk. So in response to uh, overall incentive to lower carbon footprint and energy uh, in BNR, uh, biological process related wastewater or other biological process, I think effort has been uh, taken in either directly greenhouse gas emission reductions through their uh, various uh, strategies, as well as indirect reduction, uh, mostly is through the operation innovation or operation optimization along the line of a bet, uh, less chemical usage, less sludge, uh, sludge reduction, uh, as well as overall more efficient use of carbon. So look at some of the efforts being going on uh, recently. I kind of put together uh, this summary table, list some of the efforts or certain directions. So uh, shortcut nitritation or, or nitrite shunt effort have been going on for, uh, for a while. I have a lot of wealth of uh, uh, information and the literature in that area. Uh, we recognize there's still some challenges remaining, uh, particularly how do we better uh, use this concept at low strength wastewater and how can we uh, better control the potential emission of greenhouse emission gases. And efforts also been uh, put forward, including several panelists today presented uh, along the direction of a partial nitrification combined with anamox or partial denitrification uh, combined with downstream uh, anamox. And I think a PNA uh, has been quite demonstrated at both pilot and full scale. Uh, but mostly, uh, su most successful stories are associated in generally with high strength uh, wastewater. How do we apply that in uh, low strength uh, uh, full scale plan? I think still there are works ongoing. And particularly in recent years, a number of groups have demonstrated that uh, they can successfully achieve partial denitrification uh, with downstream uh, NMOX, including HRSD and several other groups around the world. And I think fundamentals along this line are still being explored to better understand the biochemistry and the mechanism ecology behind what is the really the controlling factor to allow us to achieve a reliable and a stable PDNA. But one element I particularly want to point out is that one of the main challenging to achieve PNA is actually the NOB out selection and how can we maintain that stably. And PDNA so far based on the evidence seem to allow us a little bit more uh, room and a flexibility to uh, operate or strategize the process to allow PNA to occur. So if we can allow a system and design strategy such that the PNA and the PDNA can occur in the background in response to those uncertainty or variation fluctuation that typically lead to the challenge related to PNA and allow that in the background provide the nitrate accumulation and to enable downstream animals, I think that that's a new thought and new trend uh, need to be uh, further evaluated and showing promises. And then another direction is how can we actually better combine uh, phosphorus uh, removal processes with uh, shortcut nitrogen. Efforts in shortcut nitrogen removal process, as I mentioned earlier, has been successful, but mostly how does that take into account of the phosphorus removal has been challenging because they have a conflicting or sometimes opposite requirement regarding to carbon, regard, regarding to SRT. Uh, so for example, most of the shortcut nitrogen processes doesn't want carbon, uh, but as, as to uh, EBPR actually require a reliable amount of carbon and SRT requirement also difference and other operations. How do we understand those and uh, develop the strategy to allow both? That's another direction. Uh, people have been looking into, uh, particularly how do we uh, complement that in the full scale. And I think uh, uh, one of the examples showed earlier uh, by one of the panelists cast at HRSD is to combine actually AB stage to capture carbon upstream 
And then with B stage to do intermittent aeration, enable the shortcut nitrogen with downstream anabox and also enable BioP with the side stream is just one example along this direction. And uh, uh, here for the remaining, uh, remaining part, I want to touch upon a little bit, how can we better use, uh, use the concept of a side stream uh, enhanced biological pea removal. Uh, the concept of it is actually much uh, wider uh, than the specific currently uh, one or a few implementation strategies how to achieve. But key is really how to expand the concept to use further, allow us to maximize internal carbon usage, to further enhance internal carbon driven DNI as previous panels has presented, and also at the same time, improve performance. And uh, I think there are still rooms remaining for us to better understand the mechanism, actually, particularly the link between internal carbon storage, internal carbon joint denitrification, as well as how does a potential side stream EBPR type of strategy allow us actually enrich more organisms such as DPAOs or PHA or other intracellular carbon accumulating organs to allow us to enhance uh, that benefits. George, can you hear the question? Um, April, I think uh, uh, George had to leave for his to teach a class. Oh, sorry. Uh, so Thank he's you, not Chris. on. Yeah. 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 Um, and I'm not able to answer. I, uh, I don't have anything to add to this question myself. Uh, Kartik, are you still on? Uh, can, do, would you like to make a few comments relate to this? And we collect all questions are uh, for any panelist today. So I'm going to start with several uh, questions we have collected so far in the Q&A box. Uh, I'm going to direct them to the right panelist. The first question is, uh, this is directed to uh, George uh, Wells from Northwestern University. What do you think about biomineralization of PNN as a resource recovery from wastewater treatment? I think uh, probably that can be directly to me. Uh, so question is that, uh, in the side stream uh, or enhanced BioP uh, with fermentation, the fermentation side reactor is only actually carry out to the first half of fermentation, basically from hydrolysis to fermentation to generate the BFA. The SRT typically is controlled below the threshold where mesentages can thrive. So indeed, this process is mostly generating uh, carbon sources. And where that source come from is from those non-utilized uh, particulate or other refractory organic carbon steel residue in the RAS, or as well as partial for the degradation or decay of the biomass itself. And the answer is yes, the VFE provided in the side stream does directly go to the PAO, which are evidenced by increased PAO activity, as well as other molecular evidence to show indeed the stati uh, statistic increase in internal PHA in response to the VFE production and the reaction time in the PAOs. The next question, is N-O-H also on how DAO possible? Um, I actually do not fully understand this question. Is Cartex still on? I think Cartex gone as well. Oh, sorry. Okay. So we're going to move on to the next question uh, in the Q&A box. So what results in enhanced BioP removal when fermented SAS is added back to the ASP? Does the VFA provide additional carbon source for the PAOs? So we're gonna move on to uh, next question. Why incomplete nitrification could affect EBPR? Castor, do you want to make a few comments on this? If the question is raised by Peter Rubik. Uh, if you are there, would you please repeat your question to the panelist? No, I guess he's no longer there. So, so Young Mai, I think you're on mute. Um, uh, you may, yeah. So the question is, what's the HRT for your uh, side stream uh, P release reactor, uh, and whether it was continuously mixed or intermittently mixed? And and I think this is a broad broad question that could be answered by other panelists as well. So, uh, April, what is the typical uh, HRT uh, for for such reactors? I think uh, from the evidence we see so far in operation and practice, it's in the range of between six to 38, sometimes even 45 hours. Um, and from mechanistic perspective, we learned that there is a so-called optimum HRT if your optimizing parameter 
is to maximize the internal PHA, implying more P removal potential. And we found that transit threshold of HRT varies from plant to plant. And the ones we observe, typically for United States plant, the optimized range is typically between 18 hours to 24. And, uh, okay, and, so, and, and, and so now and do you I can use, answer, uh, answer this question. Oh, okay. And now I can answer this question. And for the HRT, for the side stream, uh, it's uh, around uh, 24 hours. And uh, uh, it is uh, actually a uh, SBR module. So we operate it in uh, intermittent modules, not a continuous one. For the, just for the side stream, but for the mainstream, it's a continuous one. And, and April, uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, the side stream uh, could be uh, 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 done on part of the RAS. Uh, typically, uh, you know, uh, can you give a sense uh, whether you would do it on the entire RAS, part of the RAS, and how much of the RAS would be subject to this 18 to 24 hour HRT? Um, and, and how would you go about doing it uh, from a design perspective? Uh, thank you, Sudhir. I think that's a really, really good question. Uh, I don't think we have a full answer, but I can share with what we learned so far. Uh, 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 question one is, what is the optimized percentage of RAS should be pulled through this side stream, right? That's the first question. Mm -hmm. I think so far from practice or from optimization energy or volume footprint reduction perspective, we want as small as possible, as small as possible to enable this working. So the lowest possible has been demonstrated working is only 5%. So that means you have you need a really, really small portion of the RAS. That means your footprint of the siphon reactor can be very small. That means it can be actually smaller than traditional A2O anaerobic zone, allow the, the, the same or even better impact. But in practice, people normally put 15, 25% as more common. And I think that's a question for myself to really uh, have a better understanding. Uh, from, a, from the mechanistic perspective, I think the, the question is, um, can you allow sufficient amount of uh, enrichment selecting factor to occur in that site room is the key. So really how much means how much carbon additionally do you really need to, to use and what is the balance of a bio P uh, uh, organism you need to enrich? I think that's an overall plant carbon balance optimization calculation. And what is really the threshold of that? That's a separate, uh, separate question. Or Stephanie? Uh, well, in the results we showed, um, we had full nitrification. It was just followed by a partial denitrification. Mm -hmm. um, broadly speaking, you know, the less NOx you produce and you're recycling to an anaerobic zone, uh, the less carbon you waste denitrifying in that zone if you need the carbon for BioP, though. Uh, there are some studies, I think, that have discussed nitrite inhibition of PAO activity as well. We did not see that up to nitrite concentrations of uh, seven or eight milligrams per liter. Thank you, Caster. Yeah, that, those are good points. Uh, okay, I have another question coming in. Uh, what is the HRT for the Citrum P release reactor? It is continuously mixed or intermittently? That's, this is directly the, to panelist Professor Lee. 10% of the RAS. So 10% of the RAS uh, and-, and On the mixed Yep. Yeah. So, so it uh, so can get uh, also some reasonable RAS thickening happening. So dear, can you speak closer to the microphone? We're losing you a little bit. Can you hear me? No, it's like a, can you try one more time? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, is it Go ahead. So uh, what I was wondering was uh, uh, a, a reasonable rest thing as well as uh, uh, a combination of uh, maybe 10, 15% could, could really make, make, it, make it for a, a very compact uh, uh, fermentation tank, I suppose. Thanks, thanks, April. I could just add that in the pilot round. Go ahead, James. But that couldn't have been more than 5%. And it was working extremely well. And so we see anything from 5 to 
But mostly, what we have seen from hospital plans is like 10%. I think that's all the questions we have so far collected in the QIA box. So if no, can we open floor more to anybody ask question before we move on to the next item on the agenda? So, sorry, uh, Sudhir, all of a sudden the, your voice become really, really, uh, really like vague and echoed, so we couldn't <laughs> really hear okay. you well. Sorry, yeah, apologize for that. Uh, I'm going to move on to the last question uh, in the Q&A box. Um, Q, in addition, what happens in the site stream reactor uh, sludge fermentation to VFA P release or as additional VFA added? Uh, I think I can help uh, perhaps answer this one. James, you're welcome to add anything uh, you would like. So, uh, so far, what happens in the side stream uh, reactor uh, can be summarized as the following aspect. One, as I mentioned earlier, you control the HRT and SRT such that you're maximizing your internal first half of the pathway of AFA production, minimize methanogen. And then while the carbon uh, is being released uh, as a mixture of uh, acetate propionate and any other fermentation product, you do have simultaneous uh, carbon uptake, a PHA formation, and the P release. Uh, we see the data of that. And over time, we found even without any additional VFA addition, just rely on 100% internal VFA production. Over time, as long as it's up to 72 hours, we have done in our lab, you take a sample during that 72 hour, you will continue, you do the uptake release testing to measure the EB, EBPR activity. You found that the activity actually over time increases, which is consistent with the continuous PHA accumulation in the PAOs uh, to accumulate for that potential uh, for P removal. And for some cases, VFA can be added as the case, uh, one of the cases presented today. That's only if your HRT or SRT designed for that set stream is too small, not sufficient to produce that enough. Then you can add additional VFA, either from West fermentation from A stage or primary sludge, but in essence, from the mechanism, as well as both lab and full-scale demonstration, we really do not need that. We can run successful site stream EPR with no external uh, VF addition. But if you're limited to footprint, uh, you, you, you don't have enough sufficient HRT, SRT, you can rely on that as a supplement. So James, you want to add more? No, I think you've covered it very well. Can you try again, Sudhir? So, dear, do you want to try again to uh, address? Yeah, I, I, I tried to uh, get my uh, speaker working. Oh, it's working okay. now. Uh, is it working? It's working now. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in 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 one of your uh, earlier slides, April, uh, I think you tried to summarize uh, the direction of some of the work that's being done in storage that uh, really uh, uh, combines the work done uh, in the Wolf study uh, that Chris. Uh, uh, George and Karthik talked about, but also some of the more recent work being done by Kester, Stephanie, and yourself, um, and, and certainly Yong Mai uh, out in China. Um, uh, and, and, and the question is, uh, one, uh, how do you maximize storage? And what are the organisms uh, that are responsible for storage uh, 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 relative, you know, the PAOs versus GOs um, to get Anamox going? Uh, especially partial denitrification and anamox, it would appear that you need biofilm processes to uh, somehow mix with suspended growth processes in some reasonable way. Um, so uh, what uh, perhaps uh, if, if, the, if the panelists could respond uh, uh, is, is, is the vision uh, overall, is, is it to uh, look at uh, maybe a little bit more of the GAO type organisms as a beneficial resource for storage, uh, especially if we want to uh, improve uh, partial denitrification uh, because uh, it, it would appear that PAOs may not be enough. Um, uh, and, and how would you actually combine all of this in some uh, meaningful way? So we cannot hear you, uh, Sudhir, somehow. Yeah, Sudhir, it sounds like a connection issue, like bandwidth mm -hmm. or something. Maybe if you turn your video off. So Bryce, would you like to uh, make a few comments representing uh, Davis, former students, before I move on, on behalf of uh, Pat to give her tribute? Yes, yes. Um, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Bryce Figdor. I was actually 
Dave's last PhD student and graduated from the University of Washington in 2017. And I have a slightly longer statement prepared, but I'm running out of time here, so I'll just kind of get to the synopsis that Dave shaped not only my life and career, uh, but those of so many others. He, he taught, guided, and inspired his students and colleagues and anyone that touched him with immense kindness and generosity. He approached students and colleagues from a position of equality rather than authority, despite his towering achievements in the industry. And, and I'll miss Dave greatly, but will be forever grateful for his mentorship and, and friendship. And uh, although I was Dave's last PhD student, upon reflection, this really isn't the case from a broader point of view, that Dave's legacy of learning, exploring, and teaching will continue to be passed on to others by everyone fortunate to call Dave a friend and colleague, thus creating a legacy of students uh, for generations benefiting from Dave's knowledge, passion, and humanity. Um, so, so thank you for the time to present these words and I'll pass it on to April to present some statements from uh, Dave's family. Thank you, Bryce, for uh, speaking that on behalf of all the students, Prosper, I couldn't agree more. So at last, uh, on behalf of um, Pat Stencil, uh, who is uh, David Stencil's wife, uh, who um, gave me this tribute, uh, I'm just on her behalf to uh, read, read this. Um, I'm still feeling too emotional about Dave's unexpected passing to speak publicly about him. Uh, sorry, uh, I think I, I understand totally how Pat uh, feels. And, but these are my thoughts about him as a person. Dave loved being a father and a grandfather. He made a point of attending his grandkids' concerts, games, science fairs. He loved being a husband and was a loving, generous guy. He also loved his work and believed strongly in doing what he was doing to contribute to society. I recently found at least 100 photos of wastewater treatment plants on my iPad that he had taken over the years. I have no idea where they were taken, but it was so typical of him to want to record those as well as to treat me as tours plants whenever we traveled. But on the other hand, he participated in a great many garden tours with me willingly. Dave enjoyed his years as a teacher and mentor at the University of Washington. Many of his connection with his graduate students endured through the years. I've heard such warm comments from things that uh, his passing. I only wish he could have known how much he was revered and loved by them. Our house became a gathering place during those years where they could enjoy dinner, wine, and a conversation without a closing hour. Dave also loved good food and wine. I know that. He became quite a red wine connoisseur over the years. Our trip to Italy definitely contributed to that. He became quite a good cook in his retirement years too. I think he considered a cooking a little chemistry experiment. So he enjoyed combining different ingredients instead of following a recipe to the better. Sounds like a day. Chili was his specialty, the hotter, the better. Probably the most delightful quality they possessed was his sense of humor. His take on life always surprised me. I could never anticipate what could, what could come out of his mouth. His unique perspective always kept my life with him interesting. Speaking for Dave's family and myself, we miss him every day, but we have such fond memory of our lives with him. Thank you. And um, I, I um, as a Dave Wonderful Dave student, and it was also extremely fortunate for me to be connected with Dave through all the years throughout my career. Just as James, uh, just a few days before his passing, we were still talking, joking, and discuss wastewater. And he's such a um, uh, kind, um, kind uh, person. And I believe everyone who have any fortunate opportunity to be connected with Dave would forever um, remember him. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, April, for organizing this webinar um, in tribute of Dave. Thank you for all the panelists and for everyone effort and help. Thank you for the attendance. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.